Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll return where we left off yesterday in the book The History of Romanism by John Dowling. Yesterday we concluded uh, subsection 29, and the author's relation to us of how it is that a Roman Catholic Church is consecrated, and that is that a so-called holy relic is ceremonially and pathetically placed within the altar of a Roman Catholic Church by certain rites and rituals that we related yesterday in the pro- on the program. Before I continue this morning, I want to ask my listeners the questions. If you can recall the discussion yesterday and about the elaborate ceremony used to consecrate the altar of a, of a new Roman Catholic Church, the question is to be asked of oneself, how is it that any Bible-believing Christian could view the consecration of an altar of a Roman Catholic Church as anything to have anything having whatsoever to do with Christianity? It can't. God's people throughout the ages from the very beginning would see this consecration of the altars of the Roman Catholic Church as a sign. The sign of Antichrist. It reeks of idolatry. It reeks of impiety. It reeks of a false Christianity. And no one throughout the ages who is a Bible-believing Christian could know of this consecration of the Roman Catholic churches as anything but a sign of Antichrist. God's people were never ignorant about what the Roman Catholic Church was and about the papacy and what it represents the man of sin, the son of perdition. And we hold the same belief today, those of us who truly believe, understand the Scriptures, we see Roman Catholicism as the synagogue of Satan, just as did the early century Christians. And this book should be read by every Bible-believing Christian. Even those who profess to read the Bible should read this book and be satisfied in their minds. What is the synagogue of Satan? What is the papacy? It's the great deception. And... We've got a long way to go in this book. And every page will remind us what every early Christian believed, that the Roman Catholic Church is that great falling away, headed up by the man of sin, the son of perdition, the papacy. Now we'll continue now with section subsection 30, after having discussed factually what must take place before Mass can be said on a brand new altar in a brand new Roman Catholic Church, recognizing it as nothing but the forbidden idolatry of that false system that rose right after Paul's passing, the great falling away, He says, to return to the origin of these superstitions. In Egypt, about the 4th and 5th centuries, another method was adopted of showing the reverence of Christians for the mortal relics of departed saints. 
in that country, according to the historian Geisler, the Christians began to embalm the bodies of reputed saints and keep them in their houses. The communion of the martyrs being thus associated with the presence of their mortal remains, these were dug up from the graves and placed in the churches, especially under the altars. And the popular feeling having now a visible object to excite it became more extravagant and superstitious than ever. The opinion of the efficacy of the intercession of those who had died a martyr's death was now united with the belief that it was possible to communicate with them directly. Okay, This all came from pagan Egypt. It says a belief founded partly on the popular heathen notion that departed souls always lingered around the bodies they had once inhabited and partly on the views entertained of the gloried state of the martyrs, a sort of omnipresence being ascribed to them. These notions may be traced to Origen, and his followers were the first who apostrophized the martyrs in their sermons and besought their intercession. So have we always heard of Justin, uh, or, or rather of Origen? one of the great fathers of Christianity. He's the one who picked up this pagan belief of, of ancient Egypt and made it a part of the quote-unquote Christian church. The veneration of relics, the veneration of the bodies of, and, and, and appurtenances of dead saints, and the idea that their, that their spirits, their souls, linger around their departed, uh, rather around their remains, and they, they can be prayed to and that they can intercede for us. Okay, this is the great origin, the great father of the Roman Catholic Church. He's believed by most Christians to have been a Christian, but obviously he was an idolater. So he can, therefore cannot be a Christian. He says these notions may be traced to origin, and his followers were the first who apostrophized the martyrs in their sermons and besought their intercession. What does our Bible plainly say? There's only one intercessor between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. He sits forever at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us. The, the bones and the, and the bodies of departed saints are no intercessors. They don't speak a word. They are dead. All right? And uh, so Origen, one of the great so-called fathers of the Roman Catholic Church, interjects into this into the Roman Catholic Church the belief of the intercession of dead saints. And he says, but though the orators of, uh, were somewhat extravagant in this respect, they were far outdone by the poets who soon took up this theme and could find no expression strong enough to describe the power and the glory of the martyrs. Christians were now but seldom called upon to address their prayers to God, the usual mode being to pray only to some saint for his intercession. So, what did this accomplish? Obviously, men no longer posed their prayers to God. The only one who can hear their prayers, the only one who can move and do and, and answer prayer. Okay? Instead, instead of praying to the living God, they prayed to dead bones. This is the great falling away. This is the Roman Catholic Church. Christians were now but seldom called upon to address their prayers to God, the usual mode being to pray only to some saint for his intercession. 
This is, this is common in the Roman Catholic Church today. Roman Catholics pray for the intercession of dead saints. They do not pray to God. If, if they mention God, it's only an honorable mention in their prayers. They pray for God to send the spirits of dead saints to come and intercede for them. This is how Satan has polluted the true worship of Jesus Christ and of God the Creator. It's a doctrine of demons. It all results from the doctrine of demons that we spoke about very early on in this book. These are just consequences of the doctrines of demons. Forbidding to marry. Okay? Now, while this worship of the saints were joined, uh, were joined many of the customs of the heathen, okay, with this worship of the saints were joined many of the customs of the heathen, unbelievers of ancient times. They just picked up the rites and rituals of heathenism. That's what the Mass is. That's what the consecration of the Roman Catholic Church altars are. They are the customs and the rites of the heathen. Remember, early on in our discussion, the Roman Catholic Church, in its earliest stages, in order to appeal to the heathen, baptized the heathen forms of worship that they practiced. They simply baptized or gave Christian names to the heathen religions or the, the heathen holidays and celebrations and the names of their heathen gods. They just Christianized and gave Christian names to them in order to bring them all in to the Roman Catholic Church. The same practice is done today. All right? With this worship of the saints were joined many of the customs of the heathen. What does it say in Jeremiah chapter 10? Learn not the way of the heathen. Okay? But the Roman Catholic Church makes a science out of learning the ways and the customs, the rituals, the ceremonies, the holidays of the heathen. And they dare to call it Christianity. He said, men chose their patron saints and dedicated churches to their worship. The heathen, whom the Christian used to reproach with worshiping dead men, found now ample opportunity of retort. Okay, Now it becomes the identifying characteristic of the so-called Christian church, that they dedicate churches and worship dead bodies. This is rank idolatry. They don't pray to the living God. They pray to dead bones. He says, in proportion as men felt the need of such intercession, they strove to increase the number of the intercessors. Okay? So now we're going to see the multitude uh, multiplying of martyrs. Okay? Okay? Martyrs are going to come out of the woodwork. They're going to have more and more and more dead bones to worship and to consecrate their churches with. Martyrs before unknown, according to the legend of those times, announced themselves in visions. That's right, people had visions and dreams where the spirit of a dead saint would reveal his the location of his bones. Okay? You talk about your old men shall have visions and dream dreams. Here it is. These visions and dreams reveal the location of the dead bones of saints. Okay? Where, where do you suppose this dream and vision comes from? Does it come from God? Would God give us dreams and visions to... Help us locate the bones of dead saints so we could bow down and worship dead bones? Where do these dreams and visions come from? Certainly not God. 
He says, martyrs before unknown, never heard of, according to the legends of these times, announced themselves in visions. Others revealed the place of their burial, and the populace were disposed to regard every obscure grave as the burial place of a martyr. Okay? You're walking through the woods, and all of a sudden you see... Underneath the row, underneath the trash on the ground, the leaves, the sticks, and all, you find a headstone. A weathered old headstone that no one had seen for years and years and years. All of a sudden, why, it must be the burial place of a martyr. And then somebody pipes up, yeah, I saw this in a dream. So what do they do? They dig up the burial place. They take the bones, have it consecrated by a priest as having been the bones of a saint, and they use it to consecrate their churches with. Every Roman Catholic church, every Eastern Orthodox church, every pagan church has a relic of some dead saint in the altar. It's not the church of Jesus Christ, I guarantee you. Now, section 31. As specimens of the kind of invocations addressed to the saints in the latter part of the 4th century, we may refer to the funeral orations of the eloquent Gregory Nazianzen upon the martyr Cyprian, bishop of Carthage, and upon his own father. At the close of the former, he addresses a prayer to St. Cyprian in which he implores the assistance and protection of the glorified martyr, quote, to aid him in the government of his flock, unquote. Praying to a dead saint to help him govern his flock. <laughs> Aren't we supposed to pray to God for help? He says, in the latter, he says, I do not doubt that my departed father, quote, being now much nearer to God, does a great deal more for his flock by his intercession than he did on earth by his teaching, unquote. So, the implication is, out of the mouth of this great St. Cyprian, that his father is now more beneficial to him and the church than he ever was while he was alive. Okay, this not only implies the immortality of the soul, that his father still lives, but not only that, but that he can intercede for his son, that he can intercede for all Christians everywhere. And all he is is dead bones. All of this is product of the doctrine of demons. This is the progression of of the doctrine of demons. It goes directly against the teaching of the Scriptures. The Scripture plainly says the dead know not anything. They have no part any longer of anything to do under the sun. The, the Scriptures plain on this count. And what do you think Bible-believing, Bible-reading Christians throughout the world believed of the Roman Catholic Church when it read of these histories of the Roman Catholic Church and about St. Cyprian? They positively identified it as the great falling away that Paul predicted. And we still, we still dare to call it Christianity. Worse than that, we want to repent of our Protestantism and rejoin the Roman Catholic Church. He says the celebrated Roman Catholic historian Dupin commented upon this oration, which was delivered about A.D. 381, remarks that, quote, the church in the time of St. Gregory Nazianzen believed that the martyrs and the saints enjoyed already eternal happiness and a vision of God, that they took care of men upon the earth, that they interceded for them, and that it is very profitable to pray to them for the obtaining of spiritual and temporal favors. In other words, grace. 
merit. You prayed to dead saints to receive favor from God. Can anybody describe this as anything but the great falling away that Paul prophesied? He said it should be observed, however, that in that age this idolatrous custom of the Roman church was but in its incipient state. There is a vast difference between the impassioned addresses of orators and poets to the spirit of the departed martyrs in the age of Gregory and Basil and the regular liturgical prayers to the saints incorporated into the set forms of devotion in a latter generation and perpetuated in their worst forms of idolatry and creature worship down to the present time. So even these ridiculous things that we're reading about in the early 4th century have been compounded ever since. And that form of worship that is now manifest in the Roman Catholic Church is so idolatrous that it puts these instances about which we are reading right now to shame. In other words, it is at the height of its apostasy. It is the greatest evident betrayal of the truth that one can imagine. And it's renounced by any Bible-believing Christian for what it is. The synagogue of Satan. We do not call it Christianity. To call it Christianity is to be is to blaspheme Christ's name. And we don't blaspheme Christ's name. We call it what it is. The great church of Antichrist. Subsection 32. It is to be remembered, too, that as yet the anti-Christian abomination of the worship of images had not yet arisen. Quote, In the 4th century, says Geisler, the historian, the worship of images was still abominated as a heathen practice. Unquote. A proof of this is furnished by a singular letter of Epiphanius to John of Jerusalem, written near the close of the century, in which he writes as follows, Quote, Having entered into a church in a village of Palestine named Anablatha, I found there a veil which was suspended at the door and painted with the representation, whether of Jesus Christ or some saint, for I do not recollect whose image it was, but seeing that in opposition to the authority of Scripture there was a human image in the church of Jesus Christ, I tore it to pieces and gave order to those who had cared for that church to Bury the corpse with the veil. And as they grumbled out some answer that, quote, since he has chosen to tear the veil, he might as well find another, unquote, I promised them one, and I now discharge that promise, unquote. From this letter we learn not only that the worship but the use of images in the churches was altogether condemned at this time. As the account given by the historian Mosheim of the progress of this, kin of this kindred degrading superstitions from the age of the Nicene Fathers to the establishment of the Papal Supremacy is so graphic and so true I shall present the reader with condensation of his remarks. What has the Roman Catholic Church become today? We'll be back right after the message. First on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. 
and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. The program you are listening to is 100% sponsored by you, the listener, on this First Amendment Rights Media channel. You will notice that there are few commercials on this radio network. There's a good reason for that. Corporate advertising dollars come with strings that limit program content. So without your help, these programs cannot continue on Internet or our several affiliates. If you benefit by the educational law programs, we ask you to give. If you are admonished or nurtured by the Bible and ministry programs, we ask you to give. If some voice a cause that you are passionate about, we ask you to give. If you believe in any of these, we ask you to support them as you would a missionary on a continual basis, as if giving a tithe for Missionary Radio. These programs are not commercially viable and must be supported by those faithful to the cause of truth. Look for the button to sponsor your favorite programs at our Listen and Schedule pages on the Internet. Then, when you subscribe, we will send you the last quarterly MP3 CD of that program immediately and continue to do so with each new quarter. We will also give you unlimited archive access to all of our programs. We're asking you to give much less than a tithe so that you may also send support directly to a particular program host, cause, and anywhere else the Spirit may lead you. Do all to the glory of our God and Creator, for His holy nation, the only kingdom that will last forever. Thank you for listening. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased. It has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity. Invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update, please support First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to email me, please do so with questions, comments, criticisms. My, my email address is tom at cwaves.us, and the website is inquisitionupdate.org. Now, the author says, from this letter we learn not only that the worship but the use of images in the church was, was altogether condemned at this time. As the account given by the historian Mosheim of the progress of this and kindred degrading superstitions, from the age of the Nicene Fathers to the establishment of the papal supremacy, is so graphic and so true, I shall present the reader with a condensation of his remarks." An enormous train of different superstitions, says he, were gradually substituted in the place of true religion and genuine piety. This odious revolution was owing to a variety of causes, a ridiculous precipitation in receiving new opinions or new teachings, new Christian teachings. You know, this one, this one has just destroyed the Christian church. What's wrong with the old teachings? Nothing except that Christians, not knowing the wisdom of the old teachings, seek always for something new and exciting. Not satisfied 
with the tried and true teachings of biblical Christianity, they're always on the lookout for something new, something to which to hitch their wagon, something to regurgitate as though it were true without ever investigating the root and the cause of this new teaching, which is none other purpose than to destroy biblical Christianity. And the greatest example of these new opinions that I can give you is the new opinion called futurism. Futurism. That which says the papacy never was, is not now, nor ever will be the Antichrist of the Bible, as all the old school Christians always believed, but that the Antichrist is a single individual that comes just before Christ returns. He will deceive the whole world. He will pronounce himself Christ. He'll make an image to speak. He might even be a Jew. He'll sign a seven-year peace treaty with the Jews, begin animal sacrifices again, and, cause, and, and, and make the desolation. And then Christ will come. That's the newest opinion on the block, and it is believed by the vast ocean of Christians in the world. Those who call themselves Christians believe the greatest deception since the Garden of Eden. Because the truth is, the old teaching is, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, the man of sin, the son of perdition, that wicked which Paul spoke about, who would come at the falling of the restrainer, the ancient Roman Caesars, and he will be the terror of Christianity right up until the time Christ returns. That is the old teaching. And people got bored with it, always seeking something new, some new opinion on to which to hitch their Christian wagon, and they lead them right over the cliff every single time. And without going any further, I'll let my listeners come up with their own new examples of these other new opinions that have been taught in the Christian church for nearly 250 years. Some of the most prized, some of the most precious possessions of Christians today, some of the most heavily defended opinions of today are nothing but lies straight from the pit. Okay, all you tongue babblers out there, it's a lie. It's one of those new opinions. Okay, now that I've offended most of my listeners, I'll continue with the truth. What caused this great departure from genuine Christian piety and true Christian religion? an odious revolution of various varieties and causes, all of these new opinions. They're the subject of Christian movies, Christian books, Christian libraries, Christian sermons, Christian this, Christian that. You can't take a position anywhere in a 360-degree degree circle and not find one of these new opinions. Christianity is completely absorbed by all these brand new opinions, all of which arrived at about 250 years ago and have completely destroyed true Christianity in the world. The author says a ridiculous precipitation in re receiving new opinions a preposterous desire of imitating the pagan rites and of blending them with the Christian worship. Do you see what that is? I mean, isn't that what the apostate, backsliding Jews always continue to do? To try to mix the pristine worship of God with that ritual and rites and ceremonies of paganism, mixing the holy with the profane, 
when the northern tribes of Israel mixed the holy with the profane, God simply said, if you want to worship like the heathen, then you be slaves in a heathen land. And here comes the Syrians, took them all captivity to be slaves in Syria. You want to worship like the Syrians, then you go ahead and live with the Syrians. Same with, finally, Judah did the same thing. Mixing the holy with the profane. God simply said, you want to worship like the Babylonians, then off to Babylon you will go. So what is the great scourge of Christianity today? Romanism. You want to worship like the Romans? Then off to Rome you will go. And worse than that, you stay put right where you are. You'll be inundated by Romans. They will own you right in your own land. That's the state of Christianity today. God's no respecter of persons. You mix the holy with the profane, you're going to be punished. And that's what's happening to Christianity today. It's being punished by pagan Romanism. We're all made servants, slaves and vassals, subjects of the holy Roman pontiff. Why? Because we've abandoned our Protestantism. Just like, the Ju just like Judah abandoned God, just like Israel abandoned God. And we deserve everything we get. Now that I've lost the rest of my audience, I'll continue with the truth. This odious revolution was owing to a variety of causes. A ridiculous precipitation in receiving new opinions. A preposterous desire of imitating the pagan rites and of blending them with the Christian worship and that idle propensity which the generality of mankind have toward a gaudy and ostentatious religion, all contributed to establish the reign of superstition upon the ruins of Christianity. Let me repeat, he said, upon the ruins of Christianity. Upon the ruins of Christianity. Christianity today is not Christianity. It's Christianity ruined. He says, accordingly, frequent pilgrimages were undertaken to Palestine and to the tombs of the martyrs as if there alone the sacred principle of virtue and the certain hope of salvation were to be acquired. That's right. The Roman Catholic Church says, if you will go on a tour, if you will go on a pilgrimage to these holy places, and visit the bones of these dead saints, you'll be saved. You'll receive grace. It's called tourism today. That's just the Christian name for the Roman Catholic thing called pilgrimages. It's a whole industry built around sending people at great expense to far distant lands to visit holy places. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. Oh, take a tour to the Holy Land. Get your tickets now. And who do you think benefits from it? While making an absolute fool of you. To get you with your own, your own actions to betray your self-professed true, true Christian belief, a belief which says the saints are dead, waiting the resurrection. Christ is interceding for all of us. And instead, we, we betray our own belief, and we go traipsing off to the so-called Holy Land, thinking God's going to credit us with something. Where did we learn all that nonsense and gobbledygook? from the Roman Catholic Church, the synagogue of Satan, which still today is called Christianity. He says, accordingly, frequent pilgrimage was, pilgrimages were undertaken to Palestine and to the tombs of the martyrs, as if there alone the sacred principles of virtue and the certain hope of salvation were to be acquired. The reins being once let loose to superstition, which knows no bounds... Absurd notions and idle ceremonies multiplied every day. Quantities of dust and earth brought from Palestine and other places remarkable for their supposed sanctity were landed about as the most 
powerful remedies against the violence of wicked spirits and were sold and bought at enormous price. Did you ever go on a quote-unquote pilgrimage pilgrimage on a beautiful sailing ship to the so-called Holy Land and you just couldn't resist scraping up a little dirt from the ground and a little vial to bring home with you? To attach a little chain and wear it around your neck as if somehow God is going to see that and mark you holy, just like the dirt that's in the vessel? That all comes from, from Roman Catholicism. All of it. There's not one instance in the Bible of such a thing. God doesn't endorse that. He condemns that sort of thing. Subsection 33, the public processions and supplications by which the pagans endeavored to appease their gods were now adopted into the Christian worship. There you go. The mixing of the holy with the profane and celebrated with great pomp and magnificence in several places. The virtues that had formerly been ascribed to the heathen temples, to their lustrations, to the statues of their gods and heroes, were now attributed to Christian churches, to holy water, consecrated by certain forms of prayer, and to the images of holy men. In other words, Christianity ruined. And the same privileges that the former enjoyed under the darkness of paganism were conferred upon the latter under the light of the gospel, or rather, under that cloud of superstition that was obscuring its glory. It is true that as yet images were not very common, nor were there any statues at all, but it is at the same time as undoubtedly certain as it is extravagant and monstrous that the worship of the martyrs was modeled by degrees according to the religious services that were paid to the gods, small g, before the coming of Christ. In other words, let me put it in plain English. Any of the dead pagans throughout history who had worshipped Zeus and Sibella and Semiramis and Jupiter and Venus and on and on and on. You just name all their gods and all the, all the practices and all the holidays and all the ritual, all of the corruptness of the pagan world. If they could come and see what's done in the Roman Catholic Church, they'd be perfectly happy. They'd be ecumenical. They'd join the Roman Catholic Church because they'd find a little bit of their religion here and a little bit of some other religion there. And they'd find it all together in one place, in one magnificent, incalculably expensive cathedral, headed up by the prettiest pope or priest you can model after the fashion of the ancient pagan priests of paganism. Same vestments. Same headgear, same pretentious movements of their hands, crossing of themselves and all of it. They would recognize it all. And Christians would see it as Christianity, too, wouldn't they? You see the mixing of the holy with the profane in all of this? What was the scripture said? I would that you were, re you were either hot or cold, but because you're lukewarm, I'll spit you out of my mouth. Cold being rank paganism, hot being true Bible-believing Christianity, the pure, pristine worship of the Creator, and lukewarm being Roman Catholicism. And you know what? There's so very little true Bible-believing Christianity left in the world as to be a marvel. Kind of reminds you of the days of Noah, right? And isn't that what the Bible says? In the last days would be like the days of Noah. They were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the rains came and washed them all away. I want to ask all you ecumenical evangelic bellies out there, without really wanting to be offensive, but I really have to ask the question, 
how long can you tread water? Only this time it won't be water. It'll be fire. Subsection 34. Among other unhappy effects, these superstitious notions opened a wide door, careful choice of the word there, a wide door to the endless frauds of those odious impostors who were so far destitute of all principle as to enrich themselves by the ignorance and the errors of the people. That's right, they made a great industry out of the ignorance and errors of the people. Financial boon like you would not believe. Incalculable wealth derived by these odious impostors who enrich themselves by the ignorance and error of the people. Rumors were artfully spread abroad of prodigies and miracles to be seen in certain places, a trick often practiced by the heathen priests of old. And the design of these reports was to draw the populace in multitudes to these places and to impose upon their credulity to profit from their stupidity. These stratagems were generally successful, for the ignorance and slowness of apprehension of the people, to whom everything that is new and singular appears miraculous, rendered them easily the dupes of this abominable artifice. Nor was this all. Certain tombs were falsely given out for the sepulchres of saints and confessors. The list of these saints was augmented with fictitious names, and even robbers were converted to, to the martyrs, uh, rather, converted into martyrs. Some buried the bones of dead men in certain retired places, and then affirmed that they were divinely admonished by a dream that the body of some friend of God lay there. <laughs> Some base criminal would die. Somebody would see a, fi a financial opportunity, would bury the dude in a place that looked really run down and put an old headstone on and say, there's a saint buried here. Ka-ching, ka-ching. All the ignorant Christians from all over the world come to pay their respects to this dead saint and pray to it for their intercession. You see why the author wisely used the term Christianity ruined? He says, many, especially of the monks, traveled through the different provinces and not only sold with the most frontless impu impudence their fictitious relics, but also received the eyes of the multitude with ludicrous combats with evil spirits and genii. That's right. They had miraculous power. They could defeat demons with their holiness. This is all the history of the Roman Catholic Church. Great power and signs and lying wonders is what the Bible calls it. Those who still read the Bible. He says, These shameful impostors and frauds have indeed been characteristic of popery in all ages. Let me read it again. These shameful impostures and frauds have been characteristic of popery in all ages. What did the author just tell you? Christians of every age, Bible-believing Christians of every age, saw in popery the man of sin, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, the beast of Scripture, history, and prophecy. All you had to do was look at the frauds and pretensions and impostors of the Roman Catholic Church and you saw the footprints of Satan himself on the earth. And those who believe this were true, Bible-believing, God-fearing, God-obeying Christians. They were not deceived. They were not left in doubt about who the man of sin, the son of perdition was. They knew precisely who it was. And they were just as certain about the, ant the identity of the Antichrist being the Pope as they were of Jesus Christ being the Messiah. 
God never plays fast and loose with the lives and the souls of, the, of, of those for whom his son died and bled to redeem. No God of greatness, the God of creation, would send his son to die for us, to redeem us from our sins, and leave us a shred of doubt about who the great deceiver is. To say that God would not tell us who the Antichrist is, is to blaspheme his holy name and the holy name of his Son. But what is believed in all the self-styled Christian churches today is that we don't know who the Antichrist is. That he hasn't come yet. But when he comes, he's going to make a covenant for seven years. And in the midst of the week, he's going to cause that covenant, the sacrifices and oblations in Israel to cease. And you can't convince them otherwise. They couldn't wrestle against demons or spirits or genii. The gobbledygook that comes out of their mouth is unintelligible. To give us all a sign. They don't know what they're talking about either. They're just talking. Lies. Deceptions. All powerful signs and lying wonders describing those who do not worship the God of heaven. If I've got any audience left, I'll be back tomorrow. You've been listening to the Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. Let's pray for one another. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the Third Temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the Third Temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org.